Growing pain and more pain in Lincoln. Hey, everybody, Big Ten Ted reacting to Minnesota and Nebraska. Had to put in some work on Saturday, so I came home late Saturday, was able to watch the game later, and thus I'm getting to this reaction video here on this Sunday. So when I look at this Huskers Gophers result, my eyes beam immediately to both teams' offensive lines. Well, there's a lot more, and I'll get to a lot more, but offensive lines first. First for Minnesota, that is a beefy, maxed-out offensive line, and it has proven that just about anybody could get behind that offensive line and run for close to 100 yards. I bet I could get behind that offensive line and run for 50. Give me 50, and maybe Tanner has a good game, and we could win with Ted LaRue at running back. But <laughs> um, uh, honestly, uh, really getting back to being serious now, that is a fantastic, really good big offensive line that's going to give a lot of defenses trouble as the season progresses here in Gopherland. And they were rushing for a couple of yards at a pop and being methodical in the running game. This is what teams, some teams like to do. Methodical in the running game. And then at the end of the game when the defense is fatigued, boom, they hit the big play that Bryce Williams uh, was able to do. Hey, this running back by committee, Marquise Irving, Bryce Williams, Kai Thomas, you know, there's guys in here that have some talent back there. You got to give credit to Fleck and that coaching staff for having some depth at the running back position to be able to do some things. And what about Tanner Morgan, right? Were we flashing back to 2019? 20 of 24 passing. You take out those two interceptions uh, early there in the third quarter, and he had a really good day. He had one of the best days we've seen out of him in a very, very long time. Accurate throwing the ball. It helps when you got a big target like Chris Ottman Bell to throw to that makes, you know, throw it in his area and he's going to come down with it. That was evidence on that one touchdown catch. Um, but my takeaway from Minnesota in this game, and I'll get back to the offensive line. I'll get back to Nebraska's offensive line in a minute here. But my takeaway from Minnesota is that Bowling Green game appeared to be a fluke. And this is a team that is at their best when they control the time of possession and they run the football well, and that makes things easier for Tanner Morgan. I can tell Tanner Morgan is comfortable in the pocket. He's got time to throw. I'm watching this game, and a lot of people are going to focus, oh, Minnesota was able to really run the ball. Nebraska screwed up a lot. But one thing I noticed, Nebraska rarely got into Tanner Morgan's face, and that made Tanner Morgan comfortable throwing the football. So I think that was a big part of this. Tanner was able to push the ball down the field because he had time to throw. I'll take some heat. Uh, in the video, I said, well, Tanner Morgan isn't as good because he doesn't have good guys to throw to. He proved me a little bit wrong and says, this guy can make guys better. This guy can throw it around. He's the king of throwing it to the hyphenated receiver. <laughs> you know, you look at all the hyphenated names in that receiving core. Uh, for Minnesota. But I really like what I saw out of the Gophers. And they're right in the thick of the Big Ten West race right now. You know who's not in the thick of the Big Ten West race? The Nebraska Cornhuskers. Let's talk about their offensive line. Minnesota in the second half was constantly in the face of Adrian Martinez, which made it more difficult for him to throw good balls, made it more difficult for Nebraska uh, to move the football. Nebraska was more talented between the 20s. Minnesota wanted it more in the red zone, especially when the Gophers were on defense. Now, given Nebraska did screw up tripping up down inside the five, a missed short field goal from Connor Culp. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. They screwed up. They left points on the field, but Minnesota wanted this game more. They were more energized. They were more ready to go than Nebraska. Could it? Nebraska played two night home games prior to this. Throw, I don't care. Don't give me excuses. That's kind of the next point I'm getting in. Every single week, it's something. With Nebraska. And sometimes those things happen multiple weeks in a row. Missed kicks. That was today. Today, it was not finishing in the red zone. There's been penalties. It's been everything. Little things. And sometimes I've been a proponent on this channel that says Scott Frost has Nebraska in a better spot now than Mike Riley had it. Then he left it. And I still agree with that sentiment. But we're in year four of Scott Frost. This isn't year one, this isn't a COVID year, this isn't any of that. This is year four. These things, in theory, should be figured out in Lincoln, Nebraska. And just because Scott Frost has this team in a better spot than Mike Riley, low bar there, 
doesn't mean he's a world beater right now. Doesn't mean he's doing anything great and outstanding. Okay, that's that's one thing I'll say. Yes, he's got them in a better spot, but what is that spot? It's a notch better. It's not two, three, four, five notches better. Like I think we all thought it would be right now. You look at Scott Frost and the total body of work in four years. What's he done? What's he done? His team continues to make mistakes and find a way to lose on the field, off the field. Remember in 2018 when he said, I got my quarterback in Adrian Martinez and passed over Joe Burrow? Just keep that in the back of your head. Uh, when Joe Burrow wanted to come to Lincoln, uh, you know, multiple players bolting out of Nebraska through the transfer portal. This, I mean, what positives can you say? Yeah, they're improved. Okay, he seems to be getting better talent than he did in the Riley era, but that talent isn't equating into victories. The whole point of this thing is to win ball games, is to score more points than your opponent. And they're not doing that right now. I look at the remaining schedule for Nebraska, Purdue, uh, what do we got? Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Iowa. There's a good chance, now that Purdue, you know, they proved they beat the number two team in the country in Iowa, there's a good chance that they could lose all of those games and finish 3-9, and nine, and there is no way Scott Frost is coming back to Lincoln after a 3-9 and nine season. That's just the cold, hard truth. I want Scott Frost to work. I want the local Nebraska, I want the story, the good story to work. But sometimes stories don't win ball games. Sometimes fairy tale endings don't happen. And this might be one of those cases. You know, if they keep on making the same mistakes over and over again, eventually Trev Alberts has to look and say, what else can I do? The coaching is clearly not doing their job. The, the team is not learning from their mistakes. There's not many options you have left at that point. And, I, you know, I'm not quite at the fire Scott Frost bandwagon. I'm not quite there. I'm getting closer, though. I'll admit, I'm getting closer. Sure, they played well against Michigan State, against Michigan, against Oklahoma, against some of these teams. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you don't win these games. If you don't beat Minnesota... Scott Frost has lost three out of his four matchups with the Gophers. Look at Minnesota and Nebraska, okay? And maybe I didn't realize this because, you know, I didn't see him play each other. But now that they played each other, I look at it. Fleck has won three out of four against Scott Frost, against uh, Nebraska. I think they were hired around the same time, maybe even the same year. Um, but look what P.J. Fleck's done. 2019, they win 11 games, beating Auburn in a bowl game, Almost went to the Big Ten Championship. And you look at the progress the Gophers have made. And the Gophers have no history at all to fall back on like Nebraska does. Scott Frost comes in and they haven't had a 500 season. I can firmly sit in this chair and say P.J. Fleck gets way more out of his players than Scott Frost does. I firmly believe that P.J. Fleck's, PJ Fleck's players want to run through a brick wall for him. They want to be energized. They want to be ready to play each and every single Saturday. Not sure if I can say the same for Scott Frost players. They've proven that to me. They've proven they come out They come out lethargic. The past two weeks, zero points in the first half against Michigan. This week, nine points. Nine points in the first half the last two weeks. Like they just came out slow and then they're constantly playing catch up and catch up the rest of the way and that's no way to play. I think that's enough yelling uh, for, for one video, but it's got me hyped up. Minnesota's in a good spot. They're four and two. Okay, they're in the thick of the West Division race. If they want it, they can go out and get it. But for Nebraska, man, how many weeks in a row can you keep making these same mistakes? And if you keep making these same mistakes... How can you constantly, from an administrative standpoint, how can you constant re, constantly rely on coaching this same coaching staff to right the ship when they have proven time and again that ha they haven't been able to correct the, the mistakes of their players? That, that's the truth. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Tell me what side you're on in terms of Scott Frost and his future. At Nebraska and this Nebraska team. Hey, you can take this. They're the most talented three and five team I've ever seen. <laughs> and Minnesota. Can Minnesota get into the West Division race now that Iowa showed some vulnerability? Can the Gophers get to Indy? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Subscribe to Big Ten Ted. 
I'm Big Ten Ted. We'll see you in the next one.